Connect Run Club podcast episode number 109, Running with Mel with Scott Douglas. Hey, welcome back runners to the Connect Run Club podcast. Excited to be running with you hopefully today. We're probably running with some folks right now. Yeah, okay. you guys are out running. Uh, if so, keep going. You guys yes. are doing great. Don't stop. Don't stop. In fact, you should be. Just, if, if you're already stomping now, you had a problem. Yeah, because you just hit start. Unless yes. maybe you've already listened to one podcast and could you're, you're the into the next one. That so. could be the case. But yep. hey, the weather will start to turn here soon. I don't know about some of you, but hey, I've gone out some mornings here recently. And when you get like a 64, 65, nice. that's a lot better than 75, I'm going to say. Yeah, if you guys are listening to this around when we release this in late September, it's starting to feel a little bit nicer out there. It is. It is. We're getting there. Well, um, we're going to get into our interview today with uh, Scott Douglas. But before we do that, we want to let you guys know about uh, our Facebook group. As always, uh, we've had some fun stuff going on this week. Trey, I saw a picture of, I think it was a race in California, of two guys that are both in Run Club the last 200 How meters. Did you see that? was that? Yeah. That, well, they didn't even know they, they were both yeah. in Run Club yeah, until in, the end. In the Connect Run Club. So there's a, a great picture of like a, basically a dash of, I think it was like a half marathon or a 5K or something. Yeah. And uh, two guys just two hundred The last 200, 200 meters. Yeah. And they were moving. Yeah. You could tell. I mean, both of them, their feet were off the ground, I think, in the picture. I mean, they were they were hauling. Yeah, they were moving. So uh, we, we have a lot of fun with that. And we would love for you guys to be a part. And so you can find the people that you're going to race against. Or really, you're going to find a lot of um, help and information. Uh, it's a really fun community. So if you guys go to connectrunclub.com uh, forward slash Facebook, and uh, you guys can check us out. Yeah, we've had some, we, we're able to even cheer for some folks. So we had we had one who just qualified for Boston. So congratulations. And uh, and, and, and and thankfully, you are probably not at the uh, Lehigh Marathon where the train interrupted the race for for, yeah, that for was wild. Minutes. So yes, glad that that was not our race, Brandon. Just yeah, gonna say that that would not be good. <laughs> uh, and the other thing I want to let you guys know about: so we're not sponsored um, at all uh, by anything that we do here um, at Connect Run Club. And so, uh, kind of the way we we take care of some of our overhead is we're actually sponsored by you guys. And so, if you want to check it out, you guys can go to connectrunclub.com forward slash Patreon, and that is basically a page where you guys can support what we do. There There's go. a bunch of different levels from just hey showing us your support to um, you can actually get some coaching um, from our community, whether it's from Trey or in some other different ways. But there's a, a lot of different things. It's kind of on a monthly basis, but you guys can stop it at any point. Everywhere from two bu- two dollars and up, you can support what we're doing. And we would greatly appreciate it. And so you guys can check that again out at connectrunclub.com forward slash Patreon. So, uh, Trey, we are going to jump into this week's interview, which we actually just did. We we're, just did. We were yeah. just talking about usually uh, the colors of our shirts <laughs> change between mm-hmm. the intro and when we actually uh, do the interview, but um, yours is the same. Yes, mine is the same. We actually just hung up with Scott when, and uh, I tell you what, this was... You know, sometimes we have a guest on and you're not sure what to expect. This was one, this one, not that I'd expect him to be good. This one was surprising. The content was really surprisingly well and well done. And, um, you know, I think we have probably enjoyed some of our time with, with, uh, with writers and journalists more than anybody. Yep. Uh, and this one is, is no exception. And, you know, you, there are some people who may write content and I don't know whether they're passionate about it or not. They just write content. But, uh, when you got a guy who was running 60, miles a week been running since 1979 obviously he kind of likes running just to just a just a hair but uh, his knowledge about the sport's phenomenal and so we kind of dive into his background a little bit but really we dive into uh, kind of covering some of the marathon we also get into what what lessons can you learn that's the what I most the olympic right. marathon yeah. i'm sorry so we we dove into the olympics and the olympic marathon but one of the best things that came out of this is hey what can you learn and apply as a runner and so some of that even comes from his book uh running with meb and uh, so we we dive into that a little bit but some uh, hey from how, how you develop mental toughness toughness as a runner and you know, how do you execute a race as a, as a runner you know a lot of us we can't learn from how a elite runner is running 120 180 miles a week but maybe we can learn how they apply mental toughness i yeah. mean would you love to be as mentally tough as meb to finish seven minutes behind the leader, even though you get sick, what, seven or eight times on the course? Yeah. I mean, I'd be, I'd, I'd probably have stopped. <laughs> yeah. That would have been Be done. Be done with this. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, a lot, a lot of great tips. Again, uh, running with mortals. Um, he was the co-author 
uh, with him on that book. So, yep. a lot he, of fun. He's, he's a writer in, uh, well, I lost the, the notes here, but he is with Runner's World, yep. writes for senior a, editor, a senior yep. editor with, with Runner's World. And uh, he's written a couple of articles recently that are really good, including uh, one on the uh, men's marathon recap, as well as one of them that was very interesting that we heard from our uh, friend Mario Fraioli this week about uh, elite runners posting their training and some of them doing it, some of them not. Uh, if you're on Strava, which you should be on Strava, by the way, because you can be a part of the Connect Run Club on Strava. There are a lot of elite athletes over there who are posting some of their content, including some of the ultra runners. If you want to have fun, go follow some of the elite ultra runners and see some of their crazy distances. But uh, it'll make you get out and run. Uh, that's the just truth. not that far. Not that far. Nope. Well, good stuff, guys. Well, without further ado, let's jump into our interview uh, with Scott. Awesome. Well, 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 Scott, thanks for joining us today. Again, uh, joined by uh, joined by Scott Douglas here. Excited to talk with you, senior content editor at Runner's World magazine. And and in fact, Scott, I, I, I didn't even realize it until I started looking today. I had uh, I've kind of stumbled on one of your articles this week. It was um, Mario Fraioli. I saw on his newsletter. He mentioned uh, mentioned one of your articles here recently on you know, his newsletter this week. I think it was why don't more elites post their training online. So a- excellent, excellent article you wrote this week or that, uh, that I read Thank this you. week. Well, hey, uh, th- thanks again for spending some time with us. We'd love to ca- kind of get your background before we kind of dive into uh, to the book and some of the content. We just kind of g- love to get your background a little bit. So obviously uh, content editor at Runner's World, but we'd love to get a little bit of your background as well. Sure. Um, Professional or running or yeah, what? Yeah, a little bit, a little bit of both. That'd be great. Sure. So uh, I've been a runner since ninth grade, nineteen seventy nine. Um, started running then and never really stopped, except when occasional uh, interruptions from my body. But mostly, you know, been plugging away for the last thirty seven years. Um, my odometer is at about one hundred eight thousand miles. Wow. <laughs> um, I, I was I was pretty decent maybe like 25 years ago. These days I run about 60 miles a week, um, mostly to stay sane and healthy and <laughs> get outside. Uh, professionally, I've been a running journalist since the early 1990s, uh, both with Running Times um, and for the last four years full time with Runners World, yes. and have written or co-written seven books on running that's great what, what, what drew you to running in the first place in ninth grade was there it was it was it anything particular kind of drew you in um i i had done a little bit of running during gym class track and field units where there are options to do things like a shot put or a high jump and i hated all of those but one <laughs> option was to just sort of run for the right. 20 minutes of the class program and I did that uh, sometimes by myself, sometimes with a friend, and I just really enjoyed it. And so in ninth grade, I knew that I was going to go out for the cross-country team in 10th grade, and uh, I just so I just started running on my own to be ready. I didn't know that nobody got cut from cross-country <laughs> and that I didn't need to start running in ninth grade. But I, I just I, – the few times I tried it, I liked it, yeah. and um, it was just something that spoke to me as soon as I started doing it. Could you attribute anything? You were talking about the number of miles that you run, even even a week now, which still staggers me. Are there a couple of best practices that you have really used over the years to stay healthy? I try to I try to keep my running body um, as health, you know, without being obsessive about it. I try uh-huh. to do a lot of things to keep myself so that running feels good most of the time when I do it. Um, in the hopes of not getting injured. I, I don't like being injured. <laughs> I don't like not being able to do what I want to do. And um, I find that, you know, maybe an average of 20 minutes a day, sometimes more, but of non-running strength, stretching, mobility type things help me stay injury free, which then helps me keep running. Um, and the second thing is it might sound like a lot of running, but I'm pretty sort of boringly consistent. Um, you know, I mean, 108,000 miles over the last 37 and a half years is roughly about eight miles a day. Yeah. You know, and it's not like I ever ran 160 miles a week. And it's not <laughs> like I go through periods where I run 20 miles a week and then suddenly jack it back up. I just sort of get out for an hour yeah. or so a day. And it just sort of has accumulated over time, sort of like 
um, sort of like my boring investments. It's, you know, I don't really look at them, but over, <laughs> over time, they just sort of gradually build. Um, and then the other thing would be the psychological aspect of just, you know, exploring the parts of running that I am currently drawn to the most and not feeling like I have to meet anybody else's expectations mm -hmm. about what I want to do with my running. And sometimes in my running life that has been very focused on um, being as fast as I can in road races. At other times, it's been focused on not racing at all for a year or more, yeah. um, really just exploring what I feel like doing and running. You know, it's really interesting, you know, especially with what you just mentioned, I'm, I'm coming off of, of back surgery and running for me right this minute, it has probably been the most liberating and enjoyable because I've, um, I have had nothing to focus on except, except just to get outside and enjoy right, it. Right. And it's been kind of nice to take the pressure off that. Hey, I, I'm not, I'm not putting any undue pressure on myself. And why would I put that pressure on myself in the first place? It probably has been the, the most enjoyable experience I've had in running in years. Yeah. Well, it's also always nice, you know, to sort of feel like you're making progress. Yeah. Um, you know, like sometimes people have been injured a lot, sort of sometimes have the longest careers because they sort of keep having that aspect of like, well, I'm coming back and I'm making progress. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's mostly just great to just, you know, you maybe don't appreciate it as much except when it's taken away from you. Absolutely. And then once you're able to start doing it again. I, I try to always remind myself of that feeling like I'm never, I don't, I should not take this for granted. Now, did you get a chance? Did you go to Rio for the Olympics? I was not in Rio. You were not in Rio. No. Okay. All right. What, what, but besides, I would love to, love to get your thoughts on the men's marathon in just a minute, but were there, were there any other storylines that really come that uh, were really compelling to you uh, before we even get into the men's marathon? Um, I, I mean, I think an obvious ov overall storyline and a, positive one for i assume a lot of readers was um the u.s distance runners performance mm -hmm. um how it's continued to improve relative to the rest of the world you know it's no longer like hey we got somebody in the final yeah and maybe they'll do okay you know um so what did we have we had uh medals in both the men's and women's 1500 medals yep. in the men's and women's steeple men's medal in the 5k and men's medal in the marathon and then the three women in the top 10 in the marathon, which is arguably the best U.S. team performance ever um, in the Olympic marathon. So that's, you know, that's a long, long way uh, better than what it was, you know, eight years ago, 12 years ago, uh, 16 years ago, certainly. Yeah, and, and, and what's what we're really used to as as a country is watching from the the, the sprinters. We're we're used to owning the medal stands from the sprinters, and so right. to completely see that go the other way with the distance and middle distance runners is, to me, a, a, a testament of of some of the strength. I mean, just and even looking at both marathon races and where our our runners finished in the top ten and top fifteen, just impressive, impressive performances all around. Yeah. Um and I, I, I happen to I was talk I had an interview with Molly Huddle the other day uh -huh. for an upcoming Runners World piece, and one of the things we were talking about was sort of the changed mindset of of like you know can instead of gosh can we compete with the best of the world like yeah of course we can and and so let's get out after it um, so I think that's a, a big thing and that's the sort of thing that I don't think you know that's just going to sort of build on it on itself and hopefully keep going in that direction. Hey, what, what did you think about the about the women's marathon? Obviously, with with three U.S. women in the top ten, just an unbelievable performance. But uh, any particular storylines or anything that was really compelling to you about the race? Um, I, I would I would use it as an example of what we've been talking about. That that um, you know the the U.S. women went in and and just sort of had the the, the mindset of you know why can't we? be up there yeah. there's no you know we're not in there's no reason to be intimidated by by these other uh women and they and they ran like that and, and uh produced like that i mean you could in 19 so for the stat people in 1972 i believe it was u.s men were first fourth and ninth um but i would make the argument that this was a, a better overall team accomplishment mm -hmm. because of the increased depth geographically compared to 1972 
Well, and then of course one of the one of the most impressive performances that that I that I've seen was uh, was Kipchoge in the men's marathon. Just, <laughs> I yeah. mean, yeah. you know, as you looked at some of his closing five k times, you know, you throw yeah. down a what a fifteen oh five, then a then a fourteen something. It was just crazy to see those last those last uh, closing miles he had. Yeah, so I think he ran something like twenty nine thirteen. Team for between 30k and 40k which you know will win you most 10k road races um he was certainly well he certainly helped by being the best in the world but you know they went out at like just under 106 for the first half which um for somebody who has run two back-to-back 101 30s you know must probably feels pretty relaxed yeah. um so he was um it was really impressive to watch the there I, I I don't know if you remember the point where it was just him and Lalesa were the only two left and Lalesa was sort of running off of his shoulder <laughs> and he you know he wanted Lalesa to he was tired of Lalesa being right on his shoulder and he sort of started motioning him for come around and then he started running serpentine a little bit and Lalesa <laughs> wouldn't wouldn't go you know wouldn't even pull even so she's like okay never mind I'm just gonna go ahead now and win the gold medal you know. Finished smiling like he did, you know. He did the same thing in London um, once, one time. Um, it would be great to see him in a another race where he's, you know, he go after the world record. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I had the chance to. I, I guess it was London where I saw him, and and you know, when you when you see a guy who uh, seems like such a such a neat neat guy, stand up yeah. guy, and you see a guy who's so humble. You, you you hope a guy like that really does get a shot of the world record because I can't think of a better ambassador for the sport uh, than someone like that. In fact, I think uh, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure was it. In fact, Brandon will probably know. Is it Bart Yasu who said he was pulling for him because he went and, and ran? Yeah, I think he said he volunteered to run a 11 minute or 12 minute pace over there while while uh, while, while Bart was over there in Africa with him, and so he was said he was secretly pulling for him as well. So <laughs> yeah. What the the other one to me obviously big story uh, here in the United States of course was was Galen Rupp following up a which yeah. I know was an extremely disappointing ten thousand meters and to really see him followed up with a strong marathon I, it, it it just seemed like a really really impressive run and maybe he's maybe he has found his race yeah certainly um, I mean if you watch you know if 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 there was somebody who wasn't an American. And you said, well, this guy has run 26.44 for 10K and won the silver medal four years ago. You know, a lot of people would say, well, yeah, he's definitely a medal shot. Yep. And for some reason, because he's American, maybe some of us think like, oh, he can't, you know, he's no way can he medal. It's only a second marathon, um, you know, <laughs> despite the, the long history of people doing quite well early in their marathon career. Um it would, and then when you watch him run the marathon, I mean, doesn't it look like he's barely <laughs> uh, working very hard for a good part of the way? Um, exactly. It'll be really interesting to see what he does. You know, so he's now run two marathons, both sort of championship style races. Mm-hmm. It'll be really interesting to see what his next one is, whether it's um, something like Boston, which is still more of a championship type race, or whether it's something like Berlin, you know, where it's more like a paced track race, but for 26 miles rather than 6.2. Uh, the the other thing that really stood out to me is that I'm, I'm sure I'm like many people who I've had a bad day at the office in a marathon. And, you know, I've yeah. told people, hey, when I when, when I run a mirror, well, here, I'll say this, when I run a 5K or 10K, I can predict my finish within a couple of minutes. When I run a marathon, I'm like, I can predict my time maybe about an hour or so. It's just never know how my day is yeah. going to go. But you know, when I, when I watched Meb, who got sick to his stomach the whole race, and to only finish seven or eight minutes behind the winner, I mean, that is that that, that just it's mind blowing to me to be able to perform that way, even on your worst day. It's just mind blowing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's well, he's you know great at making the best of adversity and sort of finding ways to continue to motivate himself, um, even on bad days, to sort of keep resetting goals during a bad race to then, you know, try to not give in to the bad negative emotions that, you know, maybe more of us do (laughs) and then, and then pay the, you know, pay the price for in terms of our finishing time. 
Yeah, and I, and I completely agree with you. Agree with you because I, if I look back on performances that I know were were rough for me, it it, it starts in your head, and, and the moment you yeah. lose that belief and that positivity, you know that that's the moment where you lose the race. And so, uh, you know, when you hear his attitude and his positivity, it's it, it kind of shows you how he's able to finish because it's you know when it doesn't get your attitude, it's not going to get the rest of you. Yeah, and so and one thing he does that I don't this is like so when we worked on the book together, this was really eye opening to me. Certainly, nothing that had never been described to me at this level of detail is you know before a race, well, you know most of us will say, oh, my goal for the race is X. You know, mm-hmm. he sets a series of goals, and not just well, if I don't win, I'll be in the top three. But you know, they keep going down a, a you know a cascading uh, level of of impressiveness um but but i think a, a benefit of that is that when something bad happens he's sort of you know has has thought about it beforehand and not you know not in a like oh gosh here's all the bad things that could happen in my yeah. race but in terms of like okay this might happen what how am i going to deal with it what will i what can i still get out of the situation that will be positive if you know, bad thing X happens. Um, and so when it happens, he's, he's, you know, readier for it than he, than he would be if it's just sort of like, Oh gosh, now I'm throwing up. (laughs) Well, there goes the race. Um, that was really, um, I, I, I I took a lot away from that when, when he and I talked about that when we were working on the book together. Well, one of the, that brings up an interesting question I'd love to ask you is that because, and I think I saw this in the trials with a couple of runners, but I would love to get, is it, is it just Meb or is a lot of runners do a lot of these runners, are they thinking worst case scenario? Are they thinking what are the things that could pop up and planning that ahead of time? Um, okay. So I, I wouldn't want to, I, I don't feel qualified to generalize for, for everybody. Sure. Um, but, but certainly um, I think that's, you know, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, you, you, you anticipate what might go wrong and therefore plan against it right. uh, to minimize the chances of it happening, focusing on the things that you can control and, and not obsessing about the things that you can't, mm. you know? So, um, you know, I can't, what, what would be a good example? If I, you know, I can make sure that my shoes are double knotted, you know, right. or, or something right. like that. Right. Um, I can't control whether it's 90 degrees, but if I do know that it's going to be 90 degrees, there are things I can do about it. Um, I think that there's a lot of more so than, um, the rest of us. I think that there's a lot of sort of pre-race scenario and visualization, um, both to sort of, like you said, you know, sort of how will I deal with this situation if Mm -hmm. it arises, um, to sort of be ready for it. But, you know, but again, without it being like, oh gosh, here's all the 23 bad things that are going to happen in my race, but sort of here's something that might happen. I need to be ready for it. But then visualization also just in terms of, you know, creating this mental picture of like, yes, here I am making the team, you know, and, and that leading toward it becoming something that actually happens. Well, and would love to get your thoughts on on Meb with this. And, I, and the other one who impressed me with this was was Des Linden. I, I loved how in the last two races I've I've seen her run. I mean, she she ha- she made a plan and she executed. Regardless yeah, of right. where she so finished, you watch, I, I don't know how you watched the the race. I was uh-huh. watching the um, the international live stream with these Australian broadcasters uh-huh. who, understandably, you know weren't really familiar with her and they kept, they present, you know, and she would sort of show up in the lead pack and then not be in the lead pack and show <laughs> yep. up in the lead pack. And it was because she was running even pace, you know, like she always does. Yeah. And, you know, and then starts racing after 20 miles or whatever. Um, they kept presenting it as like, Oh, pretty <laughs> Linden, you know, fights her way back to the lead pack. It's like, no, they slowed. <laughs> and that's why she caught them. And exactly. she's comfortable running with them and comfortable running without them. But yeah, the, um, the confidence it must take to sort of like mm. I'm running my race and there they go. And if I get, if they come back to me, great, would love the company, but I'm also comfortable doing it by myself. Right. Yeah. So she did the same thing in, in Boston where she would um, not this year, but the year before where she would sort of show up in the lead pack and then not be in the lead pack. Yeah. And then, Oh, she's leading again. Um, yeah. It's a lot of, um, a lot of mental, strength to run that race 
Yeah, I remember reading, uh, I guess it was Kevin Hansen. I think he sent out something the next week uh, on a newsletter. And that was one of the things he said. And it was remarkable to me. I didn't really pay attention to her time until he put it in the newsletter. And I think there was a four-second difference between her first half and her second half. And, I mean, right. that's, that's just yeah, that's yeah. remarkable. Yeah, yeah. That's it, what, you know, they, they practice that in training um, hmm. with their, you know, their famous Hansen simulator where – I think it's like four weeks before the race, they run 26.2 kilometers at race wow. pace on a course that mimics the course that they're going to be racing on. And then so they, you know, they pretty much say, OK, that's the pace that you're fit to run on race day. Do you think as the average runner, the average marathon, do you think we may not put enough thought process into how we're going to execute our race? That's probably fair to say. Yeah, I mean, um Especially, you know, especially, um, so, so I just mentioned the Hansons thing where they're doing this 26.2K thing at race pace mm-hmm. that obviously they've built up to. I think that there's a tendency more with everyday runners that, you know, we sort of, well, we do our easy runs at eight minute pace and we do our speed work at six minute pace. So we think, well, the average is seven minute, you know, then therefore I'm ready to run seven minute pace you know, in my marathon or something um, without really doing much work at that effort level. Um, And so you haven't not only not mentally prepared, but not really physically prepared for it. But um, I think that then that physical preparation at race pace, of course, imparts the mental benefits of learning what that pace is like and how to deal with the the feelings that you have at that pace, um, the sensations that you have at that pace that, that, might be lacking from a lot of people's um, training program. So, you know, not just the physical aspect of doing the the training at marathon race pace, but then the mental lessons that you get from that would go a long way towards mental preparation for the race. You know, and it's one of the things I think we've done, especially the last six months from – uh, from the coaches to uh, sports psychologists, we've talked uh, we've talked to, to a lot of folks, and that's probably of all the folks we've talked to recently. One of the biggest things they keep going back to is the mental preparation, and that mm-hmm. uh, you know we, we can train all day long, but boy, if we if we're going to a race, you know, not mentally prepared, then we go into a race already almost defeated. Yeah, um, one interesting thing that I noted, and this was a, wasn't just marathoners. Um, before the Olympics, a lot of you'd see a lot of elites are like on their Twitter accounts or whatever. They're like, "Okay, checking out now." Like they like mm-hmm. like the two or three days before the race, they're like, "I you know I'm 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 not going to be on here." Yeah. Um, uh, sort of recognizing that that and maybe um, that is a drain on mental energy and focus. When, you know when you want to sort of gather your resources, just like. You know, for the average listener, when you go to Boston or another big marathon, sort of not getting caught up in all the, I'm going to go to the expo and I'm going to go to this seminar and this talk, you know, stepping away from that stuff and sort of turning more into your, turning more in on yourself and sort of, you know, harboring your mental resources before the race. Um, That was something I I was, that was the first time I'd seen that, Um, you know, obviously given that social media is so much bigger than it was four years ago, but it was very interesting to see all these elites just sort of like off Twitter for the next, you know, till my race is over. <laughs> Pretty smart. That is, that is. Hey, so we'd love to talk a little bit about the, uh, the book Meb for Mortals. Where, where did the idea of, of the uh, book come from with Meb? Um, the general idea came from, um, <laughs> uh, you know, he, so he won Boston in 2014 uh-huh. and, um, I, I thought it'd be really smart for somebody to put out a book with Meb before mm-hmm. he defended his title at Boston in 2015. And I was arrogant enough to think that I should be the one to write it with him. <laughs> um, the, the, the specific idea for the content of the book um, was initially from David Willey, the editor in chief of Runner's World. Um, there had been an article in Runner's World, maybe maybe 2008-ish, just to show, show how long his yep. career is, 2009. It was wow. called Met for Mortals, and it was a very, um, uh, you know, a shorter sort of here's what Meb does and how you can do it. And, the, and you know, that was, as soon as David proposed that idea, it was obvious that that was what, that was the correct, you know, approach to what, what the Meb Kofleski 
second book should be because he had done his he had already done his life story memoir um in a book called run to overcome after he won new york in mm-hmm. 2009 wow well are there a couple of things from the from the book itself i, I was i was kind of looking over it uh hey from from the eating to the stretching to the how we cross how cross trains and i would imagine especially for someone who is now a master's runner i, I would imagine there's some 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 big big lessons we could pick up on Sure. Um, so we've talked a lot um, already about sort of psychological and mental things. Mm-hmm. And that was, that is definitely, I think, the key um, for Matt. Obviously, he's incredibly gifted physically um, and he trains very hard. But a lot of people train very hard yep. and a lot of people are very physically gifted and they haven't achieved what Meb has achieved. Um, so this psychological aspect um, of sort of like informed self-belief, you know, so you're not clueless. You're not saying, you know, if you're a 330 marathoner, you're not saying, I'm going to run 250, you know, yeah. but um, setting setting high goals, but reasonable goals, and then um, having the belief that you'll get there eventually. You might not get there right away, but you will eventually. Um and this idea of finding a way to pull out the positive from any experience. Mm. Um, and again, that's not, that's not necessarily this sort of clueless, like everything's great yep. <laughs> um, mindset, but you know, okay, if I, I had this experience rather than in it, maybe it wasn't great, but um, rather than wallowing in it and saying how how much I suck and <laughs> all this yeah. sort of stuff and what a stupid sport running is, saying what can I learn from it? Um, what 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 were the positives from it? Um, often that being what can I learn from it? So psychological um, sort of strengths were one big thing that I think applies can apply to anybody. Obviously. Yeah. Um, when you asked about my running history, I, I, you know, briefly mentioned sort of self-care and Meb is, you know, above and beyond um, dedicated to that, you know, sort of maintaining, um, maintaining a running body that can hold up to the training that he wants to do to, um, to that's needed to meet the goals that he has. And in his case, that means a lot of um, cross training. That means a lot of stretching. He sometimes stretches like four times a day. Wow. Um, that means a lot of, you know, sort of body weight training exercises, uh-huh. not like going to the gym and pounding weights, but sure. a lot of, um, you know, sort of what Jay Johnson would call, you know, general strength type stuff, mm-hmm. you know, mobility work. Um, and those, I mean, those are the two big ones, you know, the training, obviously there are principles that apply to everybody, but um, I think independent of what, race distance people might be focusing on this sort of positive mental outlook um and an ability to draw positives from bad experiences and the uh dedication to keep you keeping your body in shape to hold up to the training that you want to do to meet your goals those are two really really big keys and one other thing on the psychological thing um and it sort of ties to the physical thing is one thing i really got out of the book was you know that there's always something you can improve on um you know it might not be how fast you you do your mile repeats you might not you know you might be at a time in your life where you can't pr anymore but that doesn't mean you can't improve in other aspects Mm -hmm. you know you may be um maybe you Maybe you sit all day at work and, um, you know, you have horrible hamstring tightness. Well, you know, there's something you can do about that. Or maybe halfway through all your races, you um, sort of give up mentally. Well, there's something you can do about that. You know, this this idea that there's always something that you can improve on, and that's often a physical thing, but it's um, sort of overall, over sort of an overarching physio- uh, psychological attitude of, I, you know, I, I can be better tomorrow than I am today. Yeah. 
I, I love your take on that because it, as I was reading your article about uh, about the elites posting their training online, I, I I remember when I first started looking at some training, I was like, yeah, that doesn't do anything for me. <laughs> I'm like, cause, uh, but here's but I, I, what you said, I love and and I think is how I've watched marathons the last couple of years. I love to be able to like learn from the footnotes. So like. Hey, is there something in your training run today? Was there something that you learned? Was there something about yourself that you're learning? And, and I love to, I love the the mental toughness and how they're developing each self, uh, how developing themselves each and every day. And those are the things that are fascinating to me. No, I can't learn if you're running 120 miles a week. I can't do anything with that. But yeah, if, if you had to develop something during your run today, that that's something that I can relate to. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Awesome. Well, well, Scott, we're very grateful you would spend some time with us today. This has been very enlightening and uh, excited to kind of keep up with your work. And, and thanks for the work that you're doing in front of us. Well, we appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Hey, have a great day now. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.